Pierre-Louis Moreau de Maupertuis was a French mathematician, philosopher and man of letters. He became the director of the Académie des Sciences, and the first president of the Prussian Academy of Science. At the invitation of Frederick the Great, Maupertuis made an expedition to Lapland to determine the shape of the Earth. He is often credited with having invented the principle of least action, a version is known as Maupertuis principle, an integral equation that determines the path followed by a physical system. His work in natural history is interesting in relation to modern science, since he touched on aspects of heredity and the struggle for life. Biography Maupertuis was born at Saint-Malo, France, to a moderately wealthy family of merchant corsairs. His father, René, had been involved in a number of enterprises that were central to the monarchy so that he thrived socially and politically. The son was educated in mathematics by a private tutor, Nicolas Gizanet, and upon completing his formal education his father secured him a largely honorific cavalry commission. After three years in the cavalry, during which time he became acquainted with fashionable social and mathematical circles, he moved to Paris and began building his reputation as a mathematician and literary wit. In 1723 he was admitted to the Académie des Sciences. His early mathematical work revolved around the vis viva controversy, for which Maupertuis developed and extended the work of Isaac Newton and argued against the waning Cartesian mechanics. In the 1730s, the shape of the Earth became a flashpoint in the battle among rival systems of mechanics. Maupertuis, based on his exposition of Newton predicted that the Earth should be oblate, while his rival Jacques Cassini measured it astronomically to be prolate. In 1736 Maupertuis acted as chief of the French geodesic mission sent by King Louis XV to Lapland to measure the length of a degree of arc of the Meridian. His results, which he published in a book detailing his procedures, essentially settled the controversy in his favor. The book included an adventure narrative of the expedition, and an account of the Kama Java inscriptions. On his return home he became a member of almost all the scientific societies of Europe. After the Lapland expedition, Maupertuis set about generalizing his earlier mathematical work proposing the principle of least action as a metaphysical principle that underlies all the laws of mechanics. He also expanded into the biological realm, anonymously publishing a book that was part popular science, part philosophy, and part erotica, the acute news physique. In that work, Maupertuis proposed a theory of generation in which organic matter possessed a self-organizing intelligence that was analogous to the contemporary chemical concept of affinities, which was widely read and commented upon favorably by Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon. He later developed his views on living things further in a more formal pseudonymous work that explored heredity collecting evidence that confirmed the contributions of both sexes and treated variations as statistical phenomena. In 1740 Maupertuis went to Berlin at the invitation of Frederick II of Prussia, and took part in the Battle of Molwitz, where he was taken prisoner by the Austrians. On his release he returned to Berlin, and thence to Paris, where he was elected director of the Academy of Sciences in 1742, and in the following year was admitted into the Académie Française. Returning to Berlin in 1744, again at the desire of Frederick II, he was chosen president of the Royal Prussian Academy of Sciences in 1746, which he controlled with the help of Leonhard Euler until his death. His position became extremely awkward with the outbreak of the Seven Years' War between his home country and his patrons, and his reputation suffered in both Paris and Berlin. Finding his health declining, he retired in 1757 to the south of France, but went in 1758 to Basel, where he died a year later. More mature difficult disposition involved him in constant quarrels of which his controversies with Samuel Kuhnig and Voltaire during the latter part of his life are examples. 
The brilliance of much of what he did was undermined by his tendency to leave work unfinished, his failure to realize his own potential. It was the insight of genius that led him to least action principle, but a lack of intellectual energy or rigor that prevented his giving it the mathematical foundation that Lagrange would provide. He reveals remarkable powers of perception in heredity, in understanding the mechanism by which species developed, even in immunology, but no fully elaborated theory. His philosophical work is his most enthralling, bold, exciting, well-argued, evolution. Some historians of science point to his work in biology as a significant precursor to the development of evolutionary theory specifically the theory of natural selection. Other writers contend that his remarks are cursory, vague, or incidental to that particular argument. May's verdict was, he was neither an evolutionist, nor one of the founders of the theory of natural selection, but, he was one of the pioneers of genetics. Maupertuis espoused a theory of pangenesis, postulating particles from both mother and father as responsible for the characters of the child. Maupertuis was a strong critic of the natural theologians, pointing to phenomena incompatible with the concept of a good and wise creator. He was also one of the first to consider animals in terms of variable populations. In opposition to the natural history tradition that emphasized description of individual specimens, the difficulty of interpreting Maupertuis can be gauged by reading the original works. Below is a translation from V. Acute News Physique, followed by the original French passage. Could one not say that, in the fortuitous combinations of the productions of nature, as there must be some characterized by a certain relation of fitness which are able to subsist, it is not to be wondered at that this fitness is present in all the species that are currently in existence. Chance, one would say, produced an innumerable multitude of individuals. A small number found themselves constructed in such a manner that the parts of the animal were able to satisfy its needs. In another infinitely greater number, there was neither fitness nor order. All of these latter have perished. Animals lacking a mouth could not live. Others lacking reproductive organs could not perpetuate themselves. The species we see today are but the smallest part of what blind destiny has produced. Nipura eat on par diake, dans la combinaison on fort ou today's productions de la nature. Comme il n'y avait que celle rauche trouvé en certain rapport de convenance qui pue ascent subsister. Il n'est pas marve ou que cette convenance se trouve dans toutes les espèces qui existent actuellement. Le hacid, de raton, avait produit une multitude d'embrable d'individus, un petit nombre se trouve construit de manière qui les parties de l'animal pauvreant. Satisferis as besoins, dans un autre infiniment plus grand, il n'y of eight ni convenance, ni audri, taus sedern is ont peri, des animos ans bouche ni pauvre on par vivre, de autres qui manque ont d'organes pour la generation ni pauvre ont che perpetua, les species que naus voyons aujourd'hui ni sont que la plus petite partie du CQUUN destin avenue gullivate produit. A nearly identical argument may be found in Maupertuis 1746 work Les Lois du Mouvement et du Repos des Wits d'un Principe Metaphysique. King Heal points to similar, though not identical, ideas of 30 years later by David Hume in his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. The chief debate that Maupertuis was engaged in was one that treated the competing theories of generation. His account of life involved spontaneous generation of new kinds of animals and plants, together with massive elimination of deficient forms. These ideas avoid the need for a creator, but are not part of modern thinking on evolution. The date of these speculations, 1745, is concurrent with Carl Linnaeus's own work, and so predates any firm notion of species. Also, the work on genealogy, coupled with the tracing of phenotypic characters through lineages, foreshadows later work done in genetics. 
Least action principle. The principle of least action states that in all natural phenomena a quantity called action tends to be minimized. Maupertuis developed such a principle over two decades. For him, action could be expressed mathematically as the product of the mass of the body involved, the distance it had traveled and the velocity at which it was traveling. In 1741, he gave a paper to the Paris Academy of Sciences, LOI du repos des corps. In it he showed that a system of bodies at rest tends to reach a position in which any change would create the smallest possible change in a quantity that, he argued, could be assimilated to action. In 1744, in another paper to the Paris Academy, he gave his accord de plusieurs lois naturels qui en paru du squeechy incompatibles to show that the behavior of light during refraction, when it bends on entering a new medium, was such that the total path it followed, from a point in the first medium to a point in the second, minimized a quantity which he again assimilated to action. Finally, in 1746 he gave a further paper, the Loi du Mouvement et du Repos, this time to the Berlin Academy of Sciences, which showed that point masses also minimize action. Point masses are bodies that can be treated for the purposes of analysis as being a certain amount of matter concentrated at a single point. A major debate in the early part of the 18th century concerned the behavior of such bodies in collisions. Cartesian and Newtonian physicists argued that in the collisions, point masses conserved both momentum and relative velocity. Leibnizians, on the other hand, argued that they also conserved what was called live force or vis viva. This was unacceptable for their opponents for two reasons. The first that live force conservation did not apply to so-called hard bodies, bodies that were totally incompressible, whereas the other two conservation principles did. The second was that live force was defined by the product of mass and square of velocity. Why did the velocity appear twice in this quantity, as squaring it suggests? The Leibnizians argued this was simple enough. There was a natural tendency in all matter towards motion, so even at rest, there is an inherent velocity in bodies, when they begin to move, there is a second velocity term corresponding to their actual motion. This was anathema to Cartesians and Newtonians. An inherent tendency towards motion was an occult quality, of the kind of favored by medieval scholastics and to be resisted at all costs. Today, of course, the concept of a hard body is rejected, and mass times the square of velocity is just twice kinetic energy so modern mechanics reserves a major role for the inheritor quantity of live force. For Maupertuis, however, it was important to retain the concept of the hard body, and the beauty of his principle of least action was that it applied just as well to hard and elastic bodies since he had shown that the principle also applied to systems of bodies at rest and to light, it seemed that it was truly universal. The final stage of his argument came when Maupertuis set out to interpret his principle in cosmological terms. Least action sounds like an economy principle, roughly equivalent to the idea of economy of effort in daily life. A universal principle of economy of effort would seem to display the working of wisdom in the very construction of the universe. This seems, in Maupertuis's view, a more powerful argument for the existence of an infinitely wise creator than any other that can be advanced. He published his thinking on these matters in his Essay de Cosmology of 1750. He shows that the major arguments advanced to prove God, from the wonders of nature or the apparent regularity of the universe, are all open to objection. But a universal principle of wisdom provides an undeniable proof of the shaping of the universe by a wise creator. Hence the principle of least action is not just the culmination of Maupertuis's work in several areas of physics. He sees it as his most important achievement in philosophy too, giving an incontrovertible proof of God. The flaws in his reasoning are principally that there is no obvious reason why the product of mass 
velocity and distance should be particularly viewed as corresponding to action, and even less reason why its minimization should be an economy principle like a minimization of effort. Indeed, the product of mass, velocity and distance is mathematically the equivalent of the integral of live force over time. Leibniz had already shown that this quantity is likely to be either minimized or maximized in natural phenomena. Minimizing this quantity could conceivably demonstrate economy, but how could maximizing it? Relation to Kant Arthur Schopenhauer suggested that Immanuel Kant's most important and brilliant doctrine, contained in the Critique of Pure Reason, was asserted by Maupertui. But what are we to say when we find Kant's most important and brilliant doctrine, that of the ideality of space and of the merely phenomenal existence of the corporeal world, expressed already thirty years previously by Maupertui? Maupertui expresses this paradoxical doctrine so decidedly, and yet without the addition of proof, that it must be supposed that he also obtained it from somewhere else. The world as will and representation, volume, 2, ch. Ivy main works, sur la figure de la terre, discourse sur la parallaxe de la lune, discourse sur la figure des astres, l'élements de la géographie. Lettre sur la comité de 1742, accord de différentes lois de la nature qui avant jusqu'à qui paru incompatibles, vie acute en use physique, astronomie nautique, les lois du mouvement et du repos des vuites d'un principe métaphysique, essai de philosophie morale, essai de cosmologie, honors the crater Maupertuis on the moon is named after him, as is the asteroid 3281 Maupertuis.